The following program is being brought to you on the Voice America Variety Channel. For more information about our network and to check our additional show hosts and topics of interest, please visit voiceamericavariety.com. The Voice America Talk Radio Network is the worldwide leader in live Internet talk radio. Visit voiceamerica.com. The views and ideas expressed on the following program are strictly those of the host or guests and do not necessarily reflect the views and ideas held by the Voice America Talk Radio Network, its staff, and management. Your new or existing home is one of your most important assets, yet too many people rely on sites, shows, and tips from people who are not in the real estate business when making important decisions. It's time to get real and trust a professional. This is Real Real Estate Today with host Deb Tomorrow. In this series, you'll learn about making smart decisions when it comes to buying a home, selling a home, or even staying in the home you're in. Now, here is your host, Realtor Deb Tomorrow. Hello and welcome to Real of Real Estate Today. I am your host, Deb Tomorrow. Do you think people are picking up on that whole today, tomorrow thing that I was trying to do? I think so. I we're we're in episode four. Me. Okay, they're figuring out? Yes, absolutely. My listeners in Estonia? Yeah, I got some numbers back in. Uh, yeah, we've got a listener in Estonia, so... Hello, Estonia. Uh, we had a good discussion about where that is, and I think it's somewhere up near Latvia. It doesn't help me at all. Uh, we are here today to debunk the myths of reality TV real estate. I'll be honest with you, this is the height of our selling season, so I'm a little sleep deprived, uh, a little overwhelmed, and um, we're winging it a little bit today, but that's fine. We are continuing part two of uh, debunking uh, mortgage myths. If you listened last week, you perhaps picked up on the drinking game that we introduced, and I thought maybe I should explain that. I don't know. And when I was in college, a long time ago, when I was in college, it was a popular thing. We would we, we drink. We we played the drinking game with friends. Police. No, we played it. Well, I'm older than that. Then police, the police song, Roxanne, Red Light. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That too. But Roxanne. I thought you meant like watching a TV show. Oh okay. And we would do it, and you'd take a drink every time someone would say. I don't know. Whatever. Yeah, something on hey, Ross Norm. and Rachel. Yeah, with friends. Okay, so anyways, that's what we're doing. Not really mom, but <laughs> that's what Karen's doing. <laughs> Every time we say the word debunk, we are debunking mortgage myths. So uh, follow along on Facebook. Have you found me on Facebook yet? Uh, and I would also encourage you to find me on Twitter. Now, I have a story about Twitter. This is why we're going to be completely off topic today, and I'm totally down with that. So I'm very excited about my story on Twitter because I'm old, and I don't really understand what Twitter is for. I, I don't get it. I don't get how people find you, and I don't get what I'm supposed to be sharing on Twitter. But we certainly try. So if you follow me on Twitter, there are things that come out, mostly thanks to Rachel, my associate producer. Um, but I had an incident come up a couple of days ago where on Zillow, one of the number one real estate website in the world, realtors dislike it greatly because it makes us say the word zestimate and that's a ridiculous word. But anyways, someone, a for sale by owner, was stealing my pictures and using my pictures and putting my phone number and my personal like picture of me in the listing. <laughs> it was jacked up. I don't even know. So I kept email and people were calling me because they thought I had this house for sale. I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. So I c- tried to contact Zillow. I emailed them about six times. Couldn't get a response. Couldn't find a phone number. Finally found some switchboard in Seattle, but they had already closed, and I left them a message. And I was just getting mad last night, getting a little steamed up, probably taking out other aggressions on Zillow, which is whatever. So I thought, I'm going to Twitter, tweet, whatever. (laughs) It's tweet. I'm going to Twitter the Zillow CEO. I swear, I sent him a tweet. I was like, dude, Zillow, why won't you respond to me? I was so mad. And you know what? Did they? Oh, totally. He responded. He said, Deb, we'll take care of you in the morning. Awesome. And they did. And I thought, this is what Twitter is for. Have you ever tweeted a famous person? Uh, No, I have not. (laughs) You should try it because Rachel has. And that's what I was thinking last night because Rachel was like, one time I tweeted Roseanne Barr and she tweeted me back. She favorited one. She favorited one of Rachel's tweets. I definitely need to try that. I'm not sure. So I still don't like Zillow too much, but at least they, you know, they were all over it this morning. I had multiple people and, um, yeah. So anyways, if you are following me on Twitter, that's what that whole rant last night was about, if you needed an explanation. Uh, So 
Joining me, uh, as you've probably already figured out, is Karen Rastel, the best damn lender in the entire state of Indiana. And we are going to be using her knowledge a lot today as well. Um, and she's going to give me a wink whenever I ask a question that she can't answer. Um, she is bound by, can you kind of explain what you're bound by so that people don't think or don't understand why you're not? Oh, absolutely. Um, there are certain things that if you are, uh, are marketing on air or in print advertisement that are called trigger terms. So I, I do speak very general terms uh, because if any of our listeners are out there and I say one of the trigger terms, then I would have all these other disclaimers that I would need to also provide. So we could have a trigger term drinking game, but then we'd all be dead sober by the end of it, right? Possibly, yeah, yes. that's no fun. Yes. So I will try to... Um, come up with the trigger terms myself and answer those questions myself. So so last week we debunked a bunch of the mortgage myths and we still have a long way to go. I tried to come up with a list of another 10. I think we've got through maybe seven or eight last week and I came up with another list of 14, but I promise this is the last show. We're going on to something else next week. Um, I'm sure we'll find our way back to it. So get out your whiskey bottles or your butterscotch snaps if you're in my office and uh, join us in our debunking drinking game. I want to recap a little bit last week because that's the teacher in me and I just want to refresh. Um, So the things that we talked about last week, and please feel free, you can listen to my show on uh, demand on thevoiceamericavariety.com or on iTunes or on uh, my Facebook or website. There's a million places you can listen. Um, Go to Estonia. There's a fan club, apparently. Um, So we talked about it. Uh, the myth that it would be easier if you just go to your bank. They already have all your information. They know you're a good customer. That's not necessarily true. I think we encouraged you to shop around on mortgages and not just stick with your bank because they may not offer the products that you want. We call loans products, so they may not offer the loan type that you want. Uh, We debunked the myth that mortgage brokers are shady because they're not necessarily there are a few shady ones out there back in the day and that uh, ruined the reputation. Um, So, uh, we debunked the idea that we sh- you should make your decision on where to get your loan based on the interest rate. Remember that, Karen? I do remember that. So what instead of the interest rate, what should they base their decision on? They should be comparing the annual percentage rate between lenders. The APR, which wraps in all of your closing costs in addition to your interest rate, so it makes it easy for you to compare apples to apples instead of apples to oranges. Um, so demand to understand your APR. That was one of our themes last week. Are those T-shirts, those demand to understand T-shirts, are they uh, on, on the track on the way? Excellent. Um, we should probably start taking orders for this. Maybe. Mm-hmm. Um, we debunked the idea that you should make your decision on where you get your loan based on who sells your loan uh, and only go with lenders who keep the loan in-house and don't sell it. Um, my opinion is that's not a big deal, although I have not yet heard back from Central Mortgage Company on why they charge me $5 a month to pay online um, when my mortgage was sold from my original uh, lender to Central Mortgage Company. Uh, they don't have a very friendly online service. I'm thinking, brilliant idea, I need to tweet them. Do you think Central Mortgage Online CEO I has a Twitter should. account? I bet they do or oh. someone does. Yeah. All right. Stay tuned, Twitter fans. This could get fun or dangerous. I maybe need to get off Twitter. Um, We debunked the idea that if you get pre-qualified, it's going to hurt your credit score uh, and that you shouldn't even talk to a lender before you have an accepted offer on a house. That is certainly not true um, and certainly don't want to miss out on a house because you are going up against other buyers who have been pre-qualified. Apparently, the market's crazy everywhere. I had a call yesterday interview um, from the Associated Press uh, wanting to ask my opinion on the market and just, you know, what I've been seeing this year. And she said she had talked to realtors around the country and we were all kind of saying the same thing, that we were kind of exhausted and that it was crazy and that we hadn't seen it like this. So apparently it's not just here in Bloomington, Indiana. Uh, We also talked about um, debunking the myth that the credit scores you get online Uh, from like freecreditreport.com or wherever are the same credit scores that a lender would use. This was interesting. I got an email yesterday from a credit card company that I have a credit card with and they said, your credit scores changed. Yeah, I probably missed a payment or something. I don't know. That's not good. Um, So it made me think of that too, that um, it it says I can go to the credit card website and see what my credit score is. And I need to do that because my guess is that that's not the same as uh, if a lender were to pull my credit today. We also talked about if you have zero credit, 
um, people think that you can't get a loan, and that is a myth. If you have zero credit, you can get a loan. So we debunked that as well. So on to our next topics, our next debunking myth. So this was one, you know, I was doing some research. I was able to come up with a lot of these items on my own, but I did do some research to see if there were any other ideas out there. And one of the things I saw over and over again is that there are apparently a lot of people who believe that they have to have 20% down to buy a house. So can you debunk that for us, Karen? I can debunk that. Um, I know you always say that this is what we would call like our parents' loan, Mm -hmm. where you have saved and saved and saved and you have your 20% down. Having 20% down on certain low pro- loan programs will definitely, um, you will avoid private mortgage insurance. But no, you definitely don't need um, 20% down. That's fantastic if you have it. Um, that there are programs that are, go anywhere from 0% down. Really? Up to, more, you know, up to whatever you'd like to put down. The 0% down is one of my favorites. Don't tell Dave Ramsey if you listen to Dave Ramsey. Uh, and I, I do subscribe to a lot of what he believes. But uh, there are some instances where other options besides 20% down uh, is desirable. And, yeah, there are certainly a lot of um, a, a lot of loan products. And that's why you need to shop around with different lenders. Um, and what about gift funds? Can, are gift funds an option if we don't have 20% down payments? Yes. Payment? Um, most loan programs do allow a, a, a client or a borrower to receive gift funds. Typically, it's from a relative. There has to be some type of family relation there. Uh, but, yeah, we get gift funds from relatives all the time that say, I want to help, you know, John and Sue get their first home, and here's $5,000 or, or whatever that amount is to help go towards that new purchase. Cool. So that is definitely um, one option. And while we're kind of talking about that and talking about loans with less than 20% down, you know, FHA loan in my day when I bought my first house, gosh, 20 years ago, um, I think FHA loan was one of the ones that a lot of people do. And I don't want to get into too much detail about it, but I do think that there is a myth associated with the FHA loan that while it's easier to qualify for because it tends to accept slightly lower um Uh, credit scores and perhaps higher debt ratios, that the interest rate is also going to be higher. Um, And I think that's a I think that is a a myth. myth. It can be a myth. What you may see a lot of times with government-backed loans such as FHA is that it they may be the interest rate may be less than the conventional Mm -hmm. 30-year fixed mortgage rate that's out there. So your your lender should definitely go through whatever options that you qualify for specifically, and then they can make that decision. The borrower can make that decision which loan program is going to best suit their needs. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely sometimes I think where FHA loan maybe isn't quite um, ideal. If you can come up with 5% down, you may be better off with uh, doing an insured conventional. But we'll probably do another show on the different loan types once we figure out what Karen's allowed to say and what she isn't allowed to say. So. Sounds good. All right, awesome. We are going to go ahead and go to a break. Check me out on Facebook while you are listening to the break, and we will be back in just a few minutes. <laughs> Ask the experts. Call toll-free right now, 1-866-472-5787. Hello? And ask our all-star team to answer your question. That's 1-866-472-5787. Thank you for calling. VoiceAmerica.com. Are you interested in buying or selling a home? Not sure what the next step is? Deb can help. Go to realrealestatetoday.com and click on Start Here. You'll be asked a few simple questions and Deb will personally contact you to help answer your real estate questions and connect you with a realtor in her personal nationwide network of realtors. So even if you aren't in Deb's service area, you're guaranteed to find a good match wherever you are. Visit realrealestatetoday.com. Ask the experts. Call toll-free right now, 1-866-472-5787. Hello? And ask our all-star team to answer your questions. That's 1-866-472-5787. Thank you for calling. VoiceAmerica.com. You are 
listening to Real Real Estate Today. To reach Deb tomorrow or with questions and comments about the show, please send an email to Deb at realrealestatetoday.com. That's Deb at realrealestatetoday.com. Now, back to this week's program. Back to debunking more, more mortgage myths. And I think uh, Rachel's posting some good pictures on Facebook as we're entertaining ourselves. A little slap happy in uh, the crazy spring selling season. So what about student loans? Because I live in a university town. Go Hoosiers. Today is IU Day, Indiana University Day. Oh, that's I don't right. really know what that means, but we're all supposed to dress up. Neither one of us are wearing red no, for I did Hoosiers. Not. Okay, go IU. Um, but... So we have a, a, a lot of uh, academics who come in, and then they've got lots of student loans. And a lot of them think, oh, it's not a big deal because they're almost always in deferment. They are come in, they're grad students, so that's in deferment. So, you know, I had a client once who was an attorney. So you can imagine some of these attorneys have, holy moly, $120,000 in student loan debt, something crazy like that. I uh, had so many student loans, and he was working in the nonprofit sector, and I get this a lot too, and people say, oh, it's fine because I'm just going to work in the nonprofit sector for about 10 years, and I'm in a loan forgiveness program, and then my student debt goes away, which is great. That's certainly admirable, but it actually knocked him out from being able to get a house. He could probably qualify for, I'm guessing, like about a $40,000 house because of the way that these loans and deferment um, are counted against you. So can you talk a little bit to that? Yeah, I always have to tell borrowers that although you have the student loans and they are in forbearance or deferment or even an income-based repayment or graduated loan payments, uh, most of the loan programs that are out there, they're going to count that payment in some fashion. It may not be what you're currently paying, for example, if it's in deferment and it's zero, they're going to want uh, student loan documentation from the loan servicer to say what they feel your estimated payment will be after that period has expired. Um, So depending on what loan program you're going to use, they're not going to go off of that zero dollar possibly. They could be going off the higher fixed payment amount and that can definitely put a lot of people outside of that, uh, the buying power that they initially thought that they had. Absolutely. And I think those rules just changed last September or October because I know the client I was working with, we were like, let's go, let's go, let's buy a house now. Just because we knew that after September, October, he wasn't going to be able to, that how they were counting student loans was going to change drastically. So, yeah, that uh, is just to reiterate what Karen said. The student loans that you have plays into your buying power because the lender only allows you a certain percentage of your monthly income to go towards debt service. And the student loans is one of those debt services. So the more student loans you have, the less you have left over to use towards housing costs. And so that's why some people might have pretty decent income and then they can only qualify for a $40,000 house, which I don't know any market where you can buy anything habitable for $40,000. Well, maybe a one bedroom. I've got some listings coming on that are gonna be about in that range. So Um, anything else on student loans? Just I just recommend if you have student loans, get with a lender, let them pull your credit, really review where things stand. Because like you mentioned earlier, depending on what you're going to school for and how much those loans are. um, And if you can't get the documentation from the servicer, um, sometimes you have to use a percentage of the unpaid balance as a monthly payment. And that can be pretty hefty. Yeah, absolutely. You got $120,000 in student loans. That's $1,200. 2400 that's a lot of Yeah, money. if you're using 1 or 2%. Yeah, Ooh, for sure. Crazy. So uh, as a corollary to this, I have a lot of couples that come in, and typically one person has a lot of student loans and the other one doesn't. So it's very common in that situation that we do the mortgage in just one person's name, although we can put both people's name on the house. Um, so that may be a solution as well. But, um, it, yeah, it's definitely something to consider and not, not take for granted. It's kind of like I have people come in and they just – in general, they think, oh, it's not that big a deal. I, I've got good credit. It's not, it's not a big right. deal. I should be able to get a mortgage. And it really kind of is a big deal. Um, it's, not, it's not like, you know, sending a rocket to Mars, big deal. It's not that hard, you know. But it is a big deal. It's not something to be flip about in terms of just in general getting a mortgage. So kind of going along the lines with this, this is something I see a lot too. People who say, oh, I started my own business a year ago. My income's really good. So getting a mortgage just isn't going to be a big deal. Or um, I, I work on commission base and I have really good income. 
I just started doing that, but it's really good income. So getting a mortgage won't be a big deal. Karen's starting to look uncomfortable as I say these things. Like she's <laughs> seen it and she's like, oh my gosh. Um, or uh, I work as a bartender, so I make really good money. So it shouldn't be a big deal. You want to debunk any of those? You have so many there. I don't even know I where, know. To, where start. to start. Okay, let's start with this. I started my own business a year ago. My income's good. Oh gosh. Just say no. 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 You don't no. just say no. <laughs> but, you know, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac guidelines tend to look at a two-year history of receipt of that type of self-employed income. And when I say a receipt, they mean filed tax returns. Mm -hmm. Um, There are some programs out there that would allow to review just one year of self-employed income, filed tax returns. Um, But they are also looking at a lot of not just what your gross receipts are for that, uh, but they're also looking at your expenses, Mm -hmm. things that you wrote off to prop that you are probably saving money for your tax purposes. But when it comes to financing for a house, uh, when you write off a bunch of those items, then your net income at the end of the day is what the net income is. Mm -hmm. So that also may uh, lower your purchasing power. So if you started your own business, you need to show income from that business typically on at least two years of tax returns is kind of the ideal Generally scenario. Speaking, yes. yeah. And again, this is why it's important to have a good lender that you can have a relationship with and have that conversation with uh, and just be diligent and persevere. Um, but th- that certainly is something that I've run into a lot. Okay, what about, what was the second one I said? I don't remember now. Um, what about, oh, Bartender? I work on commission-based. Oh. Like me as a realtor, I'm commission based. I just started, but I'm doing really well. So, dude, give me a house. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Commission based. (laughs) Yeah. So, commission based income is also, um, they're looking for typically a two year uh, history of that, filed tax returns. Um, You know, they may even ask, going back to self employed as well, they may ask for a profit and loss statement, they may ask for a balance sheet. So, um, they definitely want to make sure that you're still on track to be earning mm-hmm. about at the same level. Now, if you're commissioned, but you also get a base salary, because I've seen that before and I've had clients in, and they're new in the commission in that job, the base salary counts. Yes, base salary the will commission count. commission is... Yeah, so yeah. on the commission portion of it, like a, um, I'm trying to think of an occupation where that may happen. Because um, it happens all the time with me, too, and I'm drawing right, a blank right, right now. Right, right. The one client we had, she um, was in, like, cable TV sales. Yeah, I don't remember that one. You don't? No, no. However. You thought her um, husband was really good looking. He was a police officer. Oh, yeah, that one. That's right. I do. Thank you for that jo- that memory jog. Mm-hmm. That is right. They're going to definitely use the base income, but they're going to look for at least the t- around the two-year history for the other commission income. And does that go for things like bonuses and overtime? Because I know a lot of people work regular overtime, but those hours may not necessarily count or, you know, or they get regular bonuses. Yeah, overtime and bonus. I think a good general rule is going to be two years for okay. those types of income. Okay. But if you've been at your employer, let's say for, you know, a few years and you every year you've got overtime that averages out to whatever, chances are it will be able to use that. Okay. So two years is kind of the thing. It, it doesn't, you know, I know when I was... Um, Getting my very first mortgage, you know, many, many, many moons ago uh, before I was in real estate, I think I had this feeling I had to be in the same job, like same job for several years. That's not necessarily the case. You can be in different jobs, but certainly the same line of work. Um, It helps. That helps. It helps to, you know, I think I think underwriters look at. You know, if you've had multiple jobs in the past couple of years, are you improving yourself? Are you going for better pay, a better opportunity, advancement, things like that? Um, I think what underwriters are looking for is that there aren't any large gaps in between these jobs. When I say large gaps, um, I personally would say maybe like 30 days in between. But sometimes in our market, it's hard to find, you know, land a job. So as long as you can provide a letter of explanation as to why there was the gap, those can be explained to the underwriter. Okay. What about, so bartender, server, we get this a lot. Um, if they're claiming their cash tips yeah, <laughs> on the their thing. tax returns, right. you can definitely, you know, count that. But um, for those that don't, um, cash is not documented. So that's... 
something to think about. And again, yes. that's why if you, you know, are interested in buying a house and you fall into some situation like that, you need to get with a lender up front. I always say that you can tell a good lender by their willingness to talk to you, even if you're clear that you're not ready to buy a house today. Um, the ones that only want the low-hanging fruit um, are the, you know, ones that you may not get the best service from. Uh, I had a, another lender, not Karen, but another lender once say to me, I need to eat next year too. And I thought that was pretty, like, that was a good way to put it. You know, I need to eat next year too. Good lenders are looking ahead and kind of filling their pipeline with clients so that they've always, you know, got something going on. So um, have that conversation if you're a bartender or a server and you need to start declaring more tips so that you can show that your income is a certain level. Um, you know, that needs to happen over a period of time, not just the week before you want to get a mortgage. I think to segue off of that too, Mm -hmm. If someone has, let's say you have a regular job, but now you're going to start bartending or serving, you know, being a server at a restaurant Mm -hmm. on the side is part time. Mm -hmm. Part time kind of falls into the category with everything else. And really needing a two year history of that is generally um, allowable before that income is counted. But sometimes, you know, I think underwriters may want to see, are they just getting this part time job in order to buy a house at? Yes, to buy more house. That's, that's a good point because we've run into that as well. Uh, what about, this was uh, similar but different. Uh, and I had this, oh my gosh, I, I remember this happening way, like one of the first deals that I ever did that my clients, they wanted to, um, they had a condo that they were living in and they wanted to keep that and buy a bigger house. And they had a plan. They had been planning on this for years. They're going to buy this condo. They're going to live in it for a few years and they're going to move up to the next house. And we ran into a snag. And that was that they didn't have enough income to carry both mortgage payments on the condo and on the new house they wanted to buy. But because they didn't have any track record as a landlord, even if they had a signed lease in place on the condo, that income was not going to be counted again for, you guessed it, two years. <laughs> I was going to say, it's yeah, there's generally a theme two there. years. There is yes. a theme there. Yeah, so when someone um, isn't able to sell their current home before the purchase of the new home, um, a lot of the guidelines do state that you have to have cash reserves to be able to carry both of those payments. Um, not all programs have that, but but some of them do. Mm-hmm. So that, that trips up a lot of people as well. So the next segment, we are going to talk about the thing that I guess probably drives my blood pressure up the most when I watch all these reality TV shows, even Chip and Joanna. I've been watching them some more. They're so cute. They are. Yeah. The whole we're trying to start a shit black revolution on the, inter- on the internet. Um, but we're going to talk about some of the financing and sort of my questions, what I would like to ask the property brothers, what I would like to ask Chip and Joanna, uh, how they do some of that financing. So we'll talk a little bit about our experiences with that. So we're going to go ahead and throw it to a break. We'll be back in a couple of minutes. Stick around. Your voice counts. Call toll free 1 866 472 5787. 1 866 472 5787. VoiceAmerica.com. Are you interested in buying or selling a home? Not sure what the next step is? Deb can help. Go to realrealestatetoday.com and click on Start Here. You'll be asked a few simple questions and Deb will personally contact you to help answer your real estate questions and connect you with a realtor in her personal nationwide network of realtors. So even if you aren't in Deb's service area, you're guaranteed to find a good match wherever you are. Visit realrealestatetoday.com. Ask the experts. Call toll-free right now, 1-866-472-5787. Hello? And ask our all-star team to answer your questions. That's 1-866-472-5787. Thank you for calling. VoiceAmerica.com. You are listening to Real Real Estate Today. To reach Deb tomorrow or with questions and comments about the show, please send an email to Deb at realrealestatetoday.com. That's Deb at realrealestatetoday.com. Now, back to this week's program. 
And we're back. Did you check out our Facebook page? Because I think Caitlin did because she posted a comment. We posted a great picture there. And she's requesting that Karen and I do a duet of some sort with the giant microphone that uh, is in between us. So maybe next week we'll work we on little work on that. islands yes. in the stream, something like that. Maybe. Okay. Or we should do like our house or something like that. I don't know. We'll take requests. Go to my Facebook page, post requests. Hey, did I say who I was or what we're doing? No, I just started talking, didn't I? This is Deb Tomorrow. We are Real Real Estate Today, debunking mortgage myths to today and helping you keep it real in the real estate business. We are, we started talking about this over break and then we were like, oh, I got to zip it because we got to save it for the show. So um, I had never talked with Karen about this before. One of my giant pet peeves that one of the things that really raises my blood pressure are these reality TV shows, renovation shows, Property Brothers, the Chip and Joanna show. I should figure out what the name of that is. Fixer Upper. Whatever. Chip and Chuck and Joanna. And they're so cute. But (laughs) How on earth do people finance those homes? They're like, okay, this is what Chip says all the time. You're all in at $425,000. The house costs three hundred, dollars and your renovation budget of $125,000. I'm guessing that these people don't have $125,000 in cash sitting around to finance renovations. So how do people finance reserva- renovations? They come into my office all the time. They're like, that's fine. I'll just get some money to do renovations. And my head explodes because I don't understand. I I have those it. burning questions too. As a lender, I mean, there are, there is a program that FHA does offer, um, and I've never done one in that large of an amount where like these some of these shows are. And I'm thinking, I watch those shows as well and go, how what kind of financing are they getting? Um, Certain companies may have a specialty program that is kind of similar to what FHA offers, but at that level, I have no idea. I've just, we need to call Chip and Joanna. We need to call Chip and Joanna. Chip, Joanna, are you listening? Because you know what I suspect? I suspect that the TV show buys the house, does the renovations, and then sells it to them for the final all-in price, as Chip would say. Didn't that just think. I know that just came to me uh, like it's like light bulb over my yeah, head I yeah. see the light bulb yeah over exactly your head. so I don't know and I don't know how mortgages work in Canada and half those shows take place in Canada yes that's so true too. they obviously don't have FHA because that's a, a United States federally backed program so I have no idea how that works and so maybe it is easier and maybe that's why everybody wants to move to Canada because they can do reno projects well they're doing something in Waco Texas because that's, that's where true. Chip and Joanna are they are Waco. Um, so you said there are a few programs. My experience with those programs is that there ha- are some limitations as well, right? There are, yeah. I mean, FHA has a program where, um, you know, you can't move walls, for example. Oh, like you, you can't, can't move, move like you this, can't open this up. I just I'm gonna blow this wall out. I'm just gonna put a double beam in like they, they ha- do on TV. Like they do on TV. I mean, oh. FHA has two different programs. One is structured to where you can't make changes like that. The other program you can. However, um, I don't know. I, I personally don't know what that actual limit is. The one FHA loan that I did was the one where you can't move walls, mm-hmm. you can't do room additions, mm-hmm. um, but you can definitely fix flooring, lighting, fixtures. Uh, so I couldn't paint. build a garage. Chuck and Joanna had to do that last week because they were going to close in the carport, but then they couldn't because it was too close to the property line. So they had to buy the lot next I door. I saw that one. I know. Yeah. Pretty house, but whatever. Okay, so, and the other limitation that I thought was interesting is my understanding of this program is that you have to use certain contractors. The contractors do have to be approved by the lender. I think a lot of people think, well, I'll just get the money and then my dad does this. My dad does drywall. My dad doesn't do drywall. Yeah. <laughs> Some dads do drywall. Um, and, and there's, you're not going to get the money back in your pocket as the borrower, as the buyer. Correct. You don't get the money back. And I do think that lenders, what they're looking for, depending on the scope of the work that needs to be done on a renovation uh, project, they may need a general contractor. And, I, and again, I think most lenders do want to review that builder's credentials and things like that before they, they do approve them, I guess, on their list because what they want to make sure is that that contractor is financially sound to be using your loan proceeds on, you know, on your home and not using your proceeds 
for a job that they're trying to finish up and they ran out of money kind of thing. A little pyramid scheme kind of going on there. Yeah, one of the things that, the, the way that it kind of works is that an appraiser will go out and look at the home in its current condition along with a list of your intended improvements and then yeah. try to anticipate that, yes, those two items combined, the current home, if you do these things to it, should be worth the overall all in amount that you're going to have. Um, and that's one of the other things on the reality shows that kind of always makes my blood pressure go up a little bit too, is because they say, um, they, they never talk about, are you over improving for the neighborhood? Is the house really going to be worth 420 at the end of the day? You can buy it for 250 and you put, you know, I can't do math like that in my head, but. But you're right. I mean, the appraisals that get done, if those people are getting financing, they have to have, you know, comparables in and around the subject property. So yeah. I, I would hope that the improvements that they're doing actually, you know, kind of match what's going on right. in that area. Appropriate for that neighborhood. Right. I feel like we need to call like 60 Minutes or 2020 to do an our, investigative report on Our this. people need to contact their people so that we can figure out just what kind of financing their clients are doing. Maybe they have super secret financing that we could turn people on to. Right. Maybe. So in conjunction with that is this one that I hear all the time, too, which is I'm not worried about the condition of the house. I know how to do things. My dad does drywall. Yeah. And then I say, yeah, but. (laughs) And then I feel like I'm being negative Nelly instead of, you know, Debbie Downer or whatever. Um, Because I do have a really hard time getting my clients to understand that um, while some condition issues may not bother them, it's an issue for the lender. Right. Um, and I don't think people recognize that. So at some point in the process, once you've had an accepted offer on a house, your lender is going to send an appraiser out to the property. And that appraiser is going to note certain things. Now, it depends on the kind of loan that you're getting, because certain loans, like an FHA loan that we've been talking a lot about today, have a little bit stricter guidelines in terms of the condition of the property. I don't know if this is because somebody sued the federal government at some point in time for letting them buy a house. You know what I'm saying? That had some peeling paint and they chewed on the walls and got lead-based paint poisoning. (laughs) So they had to sue somebody because they can't take personal accountability. Sorry, I'm getting off on a tangent. But I don't know why that's the case. Yeah. I mean, FHA has a handbook. You're right. I mean, and there are those guidelines that are in there. And I don't know um, where they originally stemmed from or where they came from. But, yeah, uh, there are certain things that the those particular loans you have to meet what the handbook says Mm -hmm. in terms of the condition of the property and so if you don't then the appraiser rats you out to the lender and says hey this house has issues here they are at that point you're either not going to get the loan or you're going to try and figure out with the seller how to get those issues addressed so that the appraiser can come back out give you a clean bill of health and then everybody can go on their happy way. Some of the things that I've seen uh, in my lengthy career, peeling paint's a big one, um, again, because of lead-based paint potential poisoning and thinking that we're all chewing on the walls and eating the stairs. Uh, Broken window is an issue, even if it's just the paint is cracked and people are like, oh, it's not a big deal, we can fix that, it's going to be an issue. And the screen. Like you could have like a rip in the screen. Really? Yeah, like maybe it's I been say. maybe it's been like sliced open because you locked yourself out of the house because you know my processor at work that just happened to her over uh-huh. the weekend power was out they didn't have a way to get into their house so they had to cut a screen and now I was she like, can't sell her house until she fixes that that's what I told her oh my goodness um, here's a, here's a big one missing floor coverings and we find this in bank owned homes all the time because they tend to smell like cat pee. And so, the, I, this is just, I'm just telling you my experience. I, I Thankfully, say things that, you go into those homes. I, I don't have to go into those. <laughs> I make blanket statements based on two experiences, but you know, whatever. So, they pull up the carpets, and then you've got exposed subfloor. And that is typically an issue for an FHA loan, for sure. Um, missing kitchen cabinets, missing kitchen fixtures. I've looked at it, or I've... I've had a borrower wanting to purchase a home, uh-huh. and it was probably bank owned. The whole kitchen was gone. Yeah. I said, that's, that's going to be a problem. You'll have a functioning kitchen. Right. You're not going to get a loan on that. You're not going to get a loan on Unless it. Unless you do the 203K, and I'm sure she probably wanted her dad to install the kitchen, but he couldn't do it because he's not a contractor, yada, yada, yada. Um, roof leaks, obvious roof leaks, I think those are things I've been dinged on before. I had one, oh my goodness gracious, this wasn't even an FHA loan, it was just a regular loan for an investment property I was buying, and the appraiser went out and uh, 
noted that there was a bundle of shingles on the roof. Because the roofer, I don't know, they got tired or whatever. They just left him up there. <laughs> it was a bank-owned property. I didn't really care. It was like, that's fine. And so we had to bring a roofer out to prove that there wasn't an issue with the roof. Oh, wow. We just removed the bundle of shingles and had to have a roofer write up a statement. Yeah. So there's things like that. Um, oh, I had one once where there was a, a missing crawl space door. That, that was an issue. We couldn't get the loan. We couldn't close the deal until the, a crawl space door had been installed. Where was the access? Was it on the outside yeah, of the house? Yeah, outside of the house. house. Uh-huh. Yeah. Is that for like rodents maybe getting in there? No like idea. I don't know why. I don't I, know. I can name names, but, you know, people in Estonia, I, I don't want to smear, you know, names for people in Estonia. Who are, Have you seen the one like, you know, we get a lot of rain here. Sometimes, like we did yesterday, it rained all day. Yeah, Um, a lot of older homes. You might have some moisture in the basement. Yeah, Um, you may. Hopefully, there's not standing water. But let's say sometimes I've seen where appraisals have come back, and there is let's say it's a concrete block basement, Mm -hmm. um, and there is a water line from a previous. I don't know, maybe standing Mm -hmm. water. Mm -hmm. So if there's a if there's a Remnant of a water uh-huh. line, the appraiser may the make, a nota- make a notation that uh, there's a visible water line here. It appears that there had been standing water at some point. And then at that point, we have to get. So, like, say your washing that, machine overflowed and, like, flooded the basement and it left a ring around. Yeah. Then that could be an issue going forward. Maybe. Yeah, possibly. Could be. I'm trying to think of other things. Deck, decks, deck boards, deck railings. Um, what does that say? Oh, handrails. Yes, handrails, certainly. Oh, we had that one time. Yeah, there were steps going up and there wasn't a handrail and that was a whole big thing that we had to go and sneak out in the dead of night and install a handrail. So we you say we. Them. I don't think I was there. <laughs> no, I was But I think it was, um, again, don't quote me on this. It, if there's a certain number of steps, like three, three or more or something. Three, yeah. yeah, if there's three or more steps uh, leading, let's say, down mm-hmm. from a back deck mm-hmm. to the grass, mm-hmm. you have to have a mm-hmm. handrail on certain And I programs. think it's 30 inches. If anything is 30 inches above the ground and it doesn't have a railing around it, then that's an issue as well. Yeah. So those are all things. Um, you know, I tell my clients, it's my job to kind of, when I'm walking through a house with you, they need to be thinking about how this house is going to work for their lifestyle and for their family. I'm looking at it as, can we get the sucker financed? And if I see things, then we're going to bring it to the attention. If we can bring it to the attention before we even write the offer or when we write the initial offer, like I wrote an offer, um, I don't know, it was last year sometime. And there was lots of peeling paint. We just knew straight out that was going to be an issue. And so we wrote it into the offer, just sort of Making the seller aware that, hey, you know, we'd like for you to agree that if there are some repairs required by the appraiser that you're willing to do them because we kind of think there's going to be. Um, And so, you know, we try to be proactive on that and and look at that. But a lot of people don't want to believe me. They just say, oh, it's just it's not a big deal. It's just not a big deal. And I say, and you're here yeah, to help. Is, you're here to help them. Yeah, you're trying to make know. this be smooth and But it's hard, you know, because again, thanks to reality TV, which I watch every day. So I don't feel like I'm, you know, completely down on it. But, you know, they think buying these bank owned homes are a piece of cake and they, everybody wants a deal. Everybody wants that foreclosure. And most of the foreclosures around here, at least, have those issues. Um, and, you know, gosh, I had one. We tried for about nine months to get that deal closed, I think. And it was an issue of hot water. There's no hot water in the house. We just, we couldn't get it. We couldn't get it to turn on. We couldn't get the bank that owned the property, didn't care, didn't want to send anyone out to fix it. I mean, it was just one thing after another. And finally, my clients gave up after nine months, but they gave up. So those are things to be aware of. um, And uh, we're going to be making some phone calls to uh, Chuck and Joanna's people to see if we can figure out how they how they do their numbers and how they do their renovation. We're going to get to the bottom of this. It may take us 13 weeks, but we'll get there. I think so. So we're going to go to break, and we will be back for our last segment, Debunking Mortgage Myths. Stick around. Ask the experts. Call toll-free right now, 1-866-472-5787. Hello? And ask our all-star team to answer your question. That's 1-866-472-5787. Thank you for calling. VoiceAmerica.com. Are you interested in buying or selling a home? Not sure what the next step is? Deb can help. 
Go to realrealestatetoday.com and click on Start Here. You'll be asked a few simple questions and Deb will personally contact you to help answer your real estate questions and connect you with a realtor in her personal nationwide network of realtors. So even if you aren't in Deb's service area, you're guaranteed to find a good match wherever you are. Visit realrealestatetoday.com. Ask the experts. Call toll-free right now, 1-866-472-5787. Hello? And ask our all-star team to answer your question. That's 1-866-472-5787. Thank you for calling. VoiceAmerica.com. You are listening to Real Real Estate Today. To reach Deb tomorrow or with questions and comments about the show, please send an email to Deb at realrealestatetoday.com. That's Deb at realrealestatetoday.com. Now, back to this week's program. And we're back for our final segment of Debunking Mortgage Myths. Um, and we've got a couple that aren't really about getting mortgages, but are about holding mortgages and things that you should think about when you have a mortgage. So the first one is, um, and I hear this a lot, I should never pay off my mortgage because then I'll lose my tax deduction. So I think this is where I insert some disclaimer that I am not an accountant. I have filed extensions every year for the past three years. My taxes are current, but I file extensions. So I'm just saying I'm not certainly someone that you should look to for accounting or IRS advice. However, um, if you listen to Dave Ramsey, he does this math all the, th- the time. And I, this is one thing I really agree with him on um, is that mortgage, that tax deduction. Have you ever, do people ever ask you about this, Karen? No. No? But I know where you're going with it. It okay. doesn't make sense. Like, it why would make someone sense, want right? to continue paying interest right. if they can pay off their loan? Right. So here's the thing. So say you pay so $10,000 in interest, mortgage interest on any, any given year. And if your tax rate is 25%, then that means that that $10,000, it lowers your income by $10,000. And it saves you about $2,500 in taxes, which is a lot of money, $2,500 in taxes. However, you paid $10,000 in interest to get that $2,500 savings. See, that's simple math, and I like that. Does that make sense? Yes, it makes sense. Rachel, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Do I need to repeat it? No? That's good? You're paying $10,000 to save $2,500. I don't know that that's a good decision. I don't know. Some Food for thought. Think about it. I will say that there might be other reasons to not pay off your mortgage. You know, there may be better investments for that money if you're at a really low interest rate. Some people have said, I've got um, uh, some clients who are, I think, very savvy investors and they're CPAs and I kind of look to what they do because I think, oh, you know, they seem to have their (laughs) act together because, and they, um, you know, sometimes they do think that it makes more sense for them to, you know, use someone else's money. I don't know, Dave Ramsey's head just exploded like he listens to this show, but whatever. Um, so there may be other reasons, um, but keeping a mortgage for the fear of losing the mortgage deduction, it doesn't make sense. So don't do it for that reason. That's all I have to say about that. I would say definitely talk to your financial advisor. Right. Because you're right, like, I would be reinvesting my own money to be making myself money. But if I'm not even doing that, I'm not going to spend 10000 in interest to save, to save 2500 It doesn't make sense. Um, and here's another one I want to clarify, too, the myth of the biweekly payment. Have you ever gotten anything in the mail? Yeah, we yeah. should. Yeah, dramatic music, <laughs> yeah. please. The myth of the biweekly payment. Um, you get something in the mail from your lender that says we can knock seven years or something off your mortgage. And it's so easy because don't you get paid every two weeks? That's how my, I don't, we don't get paid every two weeks, but that's how a lot of people get paid every right. two weeks. So why not just divide your mortgage payment in half and pay every two weeks with your paint with your, when you get your paycheck and miraculously that's going to knock seven years off your payment. Sounds like a pretty good deal, right? Yeah. Is it free? Is it's, it a free service? It's typically not free. There so problem number one with this, it's not free. And yet you can accomplish the same thing free. You don't have to pay that. I have sometimes like three or $400, I think, that they want you to enroll in their biweekly program. So 
let's do some more math because you y'all kept up with me so well on the whole pay ten thousand dollars to save twenty five hundred. So let's do a little more math. So your pain bi weekly isn't the magic to knocking seven years off your mortgage. If you pay your mortgage monthly, you make twelve payments a year, right? If you pay bi weekly, you pay thir- or twenty six half payments a year. So 26 half payments equals 13 payments a year, right? 26 divided by 2, 13. So instead of making 12 payments a year, you're actually making 13 payments a year. Which is only one more payment. Only one more payment, but that knocks your mortgage, it pays your mortgage off that much quicker, okay? So it's not the magic of paying bi-weekly, it's the magic of making one extra payment, And there are certainly other ways to accomplish that magic. Um, You may decide that you want to uh, take that extra payment, divide it by 12, and just add it on. Add that one twelfth on to your monthly mortgage payment. Make sure that you specify that you're paying it down on your principal. Otherwise, your lender will just apply it to next month's payment and it'll get all jacked up. So uh, that's one easy way to do it. As, or you can just make at the end of the year or when you get your tax check, just make an extra payment. Just make one extra payment and you'll accomplish the same thing and you'll save that three or $400. Um, so I feel like that program's a little scammy. I think it might be intended for people who aren't, aren't as good at budgeting sure. and it, it may just be an easier way for them to be like, okay, I get paid every two weeks on Friday, just take out one half of my mortgage payment and it's one less thing that I have to think about. And at the same time, I'm shaving years off of my my original loan term. Right, right. Certainly, it sort of is a enforced discipline. Um, and I know sometimes it is hard to discipline yourself to do it. I mean, I think I say all the time, I'll just make one extra payment. And does it happen? Mm, no, not really. So it certainly is enforced discipline. But, you know, I mean, if you want to pay me like $200, I can like yell at you and <laughs> enforce the discipline. You know what I'm saying? Rather it's just than another, another service that you offer. Right, right. There you go. I'm full service. Um, which is one thing I get asked to this day, uh, and it kind of goes along lines with this, is uh, people are always asking, you know, do, does this mortgage have a prepayment penalty? Do you get asked that a lot? All the time. All the time. But it's weird to me because um, most of your residential first mortgage transactions do not have one. So I don't know. I don't know if they're getting that information from family members that maybe got mortgages 20 years ago or back when there were prepayment penalties. I'm just not for sure. But yes, I have that conversation at least once a day. Yep. Once a day. Really that much. Once a day. Yeah. Well, then we need to debunk (laughs) that myth. So I will say that again so that it's extra clear. Most loans do. It's a fair question to ask for sure. But I have never in... I don't know how many mortgages I've seen, you know, involved in 500 plus ever seen a prepayment penalty. I have seen prepayment penalties on other kinds of loans and sometimes, and maybe some commercial loans. Sometimes they have prepayment penalties where you got to hold on to them for at least a couple of years, but they don't have like a 30 year prepayment. It's just a few years. I think the, what residential lenders have out there for purchase transactions on primary residence and things like that, you should not see a prepayment penalty. And if you do, you may want to shop another lender. Good call. Good call on that. All right. So let us review a little bit of what we talked about today. So we talked about different loan options. You don't have to have 20% to buy a house. That is a myth we debunked. Uh, If you have student loans, uh, don't think they don't count if they're in deferment or forbearance because that is a myth. They may count. count. You want to look into that. Um, If you have your own business, you work commission-based and you have good income, it may not be as easy as you think to get a mortgage. So we've debunked that uh, myth. And then we talked about my friends Chip and Joanna. I swear I'm going to call me someday. uh, And just wondered how on earth they get financing to do the renovations. um, Because it's not super easy um, to get cash back to do renovations. We debunked that myth. Uh, And also... Uh, I'm not worried about the condition of the house. I can do things. And we debunked that as um, not being an issue because it can be an issue for many, many kinds of loans. Let's see. What else did we talk about? I didn't get to everything on my list again. This Is that shocking? I think that's going to be a theme for my show. <laughs> hmm. There's just so much good information out there. I know. I And I just like to talk, I guess. This is... 
All right. We also uh, talked about um, the uh, myth of getting a mortgage um, or not paying the mortgage off that we want where the math doesn't make sense. Remember, do you want to pay $10,000 in order to get 25 Save twenty five hundred doesn't make sense, and then also the myth of the biweekly payment. So those are the things I think we've put most of those up on Facebook, and I think we're going to go through and make sure that all that information is there, um, so that everyone can take a look at it. Feel free to ask me some questions. Uh, so let's talk about next week's show because I'm kind of excited about it. Uh, I had intended. Uh, when I started this show to do listener mail on a regular basis. But as we've all discovered, I talk way too much and I have way too much information. So that hasn't happened. So we are going to do an entire show dedicated to listener mail next week, answering questions. I'm not taking phone calls though, because you people all freak me out on the phone. I just, I'm not ready for that. I need a little preparation. So if you have um, questions that you would like for us to answer, please message me on Facebook, post it on Facebook. You can tweet me. You can uh, email me at deb at realrealestatetoday.com. We'll be answering all of those questions and more. So stick around next week. Tune in uh, noon Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern. Uh, Download, listen to us on iTunes. You know the routine. We are everywhere. We appreciate everybody listening to us. Karen, thanks for joining me again. And Rachel, thank you. Everybody have a great week, and we will talk again soon. Thank you for tuning in to Real Real Estate Today. Please join your host, Deb Tomorrow, for another edition every Tuesday at 12 noon Pacific Time, 3 p.m. Eastern Time, on the Voice America Variety Channel. Until next week, take care of your home. It's one of your most important assets.